Charles Spurgeon's grandfather that they had, you were at that time that he was alive, that you would be taxed on how many windows you would have in your home. And so they would take out windows and, and, and board that up so they wouldn't be taxed on that. Can you imagine that? I mean, think about how many home windows you have in your house that you had, to, if you had to pay tax for every single window you had. And that's how your property tax would be assessed. I saw a short little cartoon that, where it was this character that was making himself look poor. So he would, you know, you, he would push this button and the wall would flip around and push another button and this part of the house would flip around because he was wealthy but then he wanted to make himself poor because the tax man was at the door and they would come in and see what you had and assess and charge you taxes on that and so this is this is and this story here that I have is kind of like that in a different way I should say about a, a tax assessor that came to his home and, and of a very poor Christian to appraise the value of his property. And so the Christian said, I am a rich man. Surprised official reached for his pencil and prepared to make a long list of taxable items. He asked, well, what do you own? And the Christian replied, I have a Savior who gave me everlasting life and who is preparing a place for me in the eternal city. What else, asked the, assess the assessor, I have a brave, godly wife and healthy, obedient converted children. Yes, and a merry heart that enables to live joyfully. Anything else? That's just the beginning. Realizing he was getting nowhere, the official closed his book, stood up included. You are indeed a rich man, sir, but that kind of property is not subject to taxation. And so this builds upon us as Christians that we can become worried and fret because of the wicked. That we look at what they have. We can th look at how they're successful. But God told us to lay up treasures in heaven. Jesus told us that. Lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy it. And thieves don't come and take it. And so... As Christians, we can live a joy-filled life where we don't need to fret, where we don't need to worry, and because, for one, the future is bright for God's people. The future is bright. Can't say the, we would say the opposite for, the, for those who don't know Christ. That reality is, is that for an unbeliever, this life on earth, is the best they'll ever experience. But for a Christian, the best is to come. The best is in the future. This is the worst we'll ever experience on this earth. And so the future is bright. And so Proverbs 37, 27, Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. This is the third time in this psalm that we have been told to do what is right. We've been told not to worry, not to fret, and we're told to do what is right, that we obey God rather than go along with what the world does and go along with their standards. We go along with God's standard. I mean, earlier in the psalm, we were commanded to trust God and do good. That was verse 3. Very early on, trust the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. And we are told this because we are tempted with the so-called success of those who are unsaved. And if we look at what, we, what the world defines as success, it's going to start a train, uh, sorry, not a train, a chain reaction. One is you're going to start distrusting God when you look at what they have and thinking, God is being unfair, life is unfair. Why are they prospering materially and that they have the good things of this life, and here I am, I'm suffering. And it could be suffering as even that you look at these, these ungodly people and they look like their, their health is all good, but it's all an image. Everything is just an image that 
the media creates and all that, they only put the, and even on social media, they only put the good. It makes things look all, make them look different than what they are. And so we, we might be struggling with an illness. We might be struggling with financial problems, problems at work with friends or marital problems. And it start, this chain reaction keeps going. That, and then what happens is what, I'm going from looking at what they have and their success, that God is being unfair with me, and then I'm tempted to be angry at God because I feel that I'm not getting what I deserve, that he's not treating me fairly. And so I become angry. That's why verse 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil doing. We can get angry with the unsaved in that verse, in verse 8, but we also get angry with God. Alan Ross says, To live with intense vexation and jealousy can lead to anger, and anger over the wrong things will produce acts that are just like those of evildoers or reprisals that use taxes tactics just as evil and so that chain reaction started when we neglected to listen to God in verse 1 do not fret because of evildoers do not be envious towards wrongdoers that we're not to fret we're not to be envious we're to trust because God knows what he's doing as I said a few moments ago that this life this part of life in the temporal and earthly, is the best that the wicked will ever have. For us, this is the worst we'll ever have, ever experience. For them, in eternity, there's going to be suffering and eternal punishment. There's not, a, there's not an annihilation that is coming. That doesn't even make sense, those who teach that, where at the moment, the, a person, when they go to hell, they'll be annihilated. Whether some say that's instantaneously, or for a little time, it doesn't make sense. That here, why would God warn? Why would the Bible warn about the judgment to come if you're going to be annihilated? It ceased to exist forever. But those who really want the Lord, then they can have live forever. That, that makes zero sense. And so they're going to have eternal punishment, suffering. For us, there's joy everlasting because we're with God who is the greatest joy, the source of joy and all happiness. And so we're reminded, and we're reminded often in this passage because we can easily forget, reminded to turn away from evil. To turn away from evil, but it doesn't stop there. We turn to do good really plan to do what is right. You know, the Bible talks about those who steal. Rather than stealing, they're to turn from stealing and they're to turn to do good, work with their hard hands. And rather than taking from people, they can use what they have extra to give to people. The Bible is always, it's not enough just to stop doing evil. We have to do good. For exa Another example would be lies with lies. It's not enough to stop telling lies. We speak the truth. And so we turn from evil, we turn to good, we plan to do good. We can't make a truce with, with a ceasefire with sin. We have to be killing sin in our lives because we're exhorted in Hebrews 12 to set aside the sin or sins that so easily tempt you and I to sin. That's what we're to do. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised and shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's cloud of witnesses mentioned. It's the example of the lives of the men and women in chapter 11. What is called the Hall of Faith mentions people like A Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, and many others. 
who lived a life of faith. And those folks that are mentioned look forward to the cross. We look back towards the cross, the Christ. They look forward, and, and it's almost as if these folks who have already won, won, run this race and have attained what they have, that here, uh, I just say, let me back for a moment, that these folks who have run this race and attain, obtained this victory, it's almost as if they're cheering you. It's almost as if we can imagine them like a crowd. If you've ever been to a track meet, that here, or even if you just watch the Olympics, that you see people in the stands cheering these people on. Well, that's what the Christian life is is likened to, is to, to a race. But it's really more of, rather than a 100-yard dash, it's a marathon. And so we would take it to where people, if you've ever seen a marathon on TV, there's people, crowds lined up for that 26 mi- over 26 miles, and it ends at the finish line that people are cheering. It's almost as if this cl- cloud of witnesses is cheering us on. To the same, to obtain the same victory, to set aside those sins, to set aside those encumbrances, those things that hinder us. And so I would encourage you to read chapter 11, because I encourage you, the life that they lived, and knowing those people, when you read them, you know what, and, and think back where they're mentioned in the Old Testament, what they, you know, what they went through. Joseph, betrayed by his brothers sold as a slave into Egypt, and what God had done. Noah, that he was built the ark, a preacher of righteousness, and only eight people was on that boat. And probably the world's population was probably millions of people. That could have been pushed in a billion. And sadly, we don't, the Bible never records how many people lived at that time, the world's population. Think of Abel, who was murdered by his brother because he offered a more excellent sacrifice. And those are just a few of the people by faith. Rahab, the hearer by faith, that here a Gentile, the hearer that by faith helped the spies here that obeyed God <laughs> in opposition that we would say um, to others in Israel as I say uh, opposite of some that here that um, and I just forgot his name Achan Achan who was stoned for stealing from stuff from Jericho taking what was banned and many others can be mentioned who lived a life of faith. And so they encourage, their testimonies encourage us to go on. The people we know that have come before us who lived a godly life, God left a godly legacy example that, that cheers us on and encourages us on. Because we ought to remember that Christ did not die so that you and I can go back and sin, his sacrificial death not only paid the price of sin, the unpayable debt that we could not pay, but also freed us from the power of sin. That it's no longer a master, we're no longer slaves, so that we can obey God and live a holy life. We're really slaves to God. We're God's servants. We're God's slaves. We're bought with a price. So we, can be, we are to obey God, live a godly, holy life. Run the Christian race. Be faithful to Christ. I mean, Jesus spoke these words on the night before he was crucified. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Not at all. And it's not, we're not trying to be th- these folks who, who are hypocrites. We're not trying to be like the Pharisees. We're not trying to earn God's favor and do right. Because 
we have to be very careful. We can fall into a form of legalism that that we can gauge our Christianity by I do this and I don't do that. You know, I look at me and we have to be very careful. But we are to live, but just because the people can fall into that, that trap doesn't mean we go to the other extreme to where we don't obey at all. Because there's those that fall on both sides of the spectrum. One's called legalism and the other one is antinomianism, where, where they just, they, they, you don't have to worry about obeying God. You don't need to speak the truth. You don't need to do any of that. Christ died. We, can, we don't want to fall in either ditch on the side of this road. We want to live a life of faith, but we want to live a godly life. A life of, of love and obedience. Not one that is going to try to earn God's favor. And that here, that, that becoming like a Pharisee, that good on the outside, but inside our hearts are far from God. We want a heart that's on fire and loves the Lord. Look at verse 27. Again, depart from evil and do good so you will abide forever. And so as I've been, build, I want to build upon what I've been saying by saying that the Christian life is a constant turning from sin and turning to do what is right, to do what it pleases God. True success is obeying God rather than going, going along with evil. The world measures success by how, much, how many worldly goods you have, your bank account, your home, how many cars you have, or what kind of car you have, your education. The world gauges success that way. God gauges success by obedience. A godly life will be, unprofit, will be profitable in the end. An ungodly life will be shown to be worthless and unsuccessful. 1 Timothy 4, 7 B through 8. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. That a godly life has much profit, has more profit that, than bodily exercise. We know that there's great benefits to bodily exercise. That's not what he's, he's not saying not to to take care of our physical bodies. But we know that if we take care of ourselves, that about what we're learning about nutrition and exercise and food and sleep and all those things, there is profit to that, that we ha- we'll have a healthier life, but it's only to this life. Godliness is for this life and into eternity. And there's much profit, much success and this is a life that is honored by the Lord. This is what this is a life that He loves. Verse twenty-eight: For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake His godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. God loves justice. He loves righteousness. He promises to never leave you nor forsake you. He is faithful to His word. He doesn't forsake his godly ones. He's not wishy-washy. He doesn't go back on his word. We don't have to worry about those things. Because we know God is a God who cannot change. He's a God who cannot sin. There's no unrighteousness in him. There's no untruth in him. He's a holy God. And he says he will not forsake his, his godly ones. I mean, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He is faithful. There are times when we think that God has, where David in another psalm says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus quotes those words on the, on the cross. It only seemed to David that because God didn't answer his prayers right away, but God was working everything out. It only seemed like God had forsaken Job. But God had his purposes. God is faithful. Psalm eleven seven says, For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness. The upright will be hold his face. See, God loves what is good. He hates lies. He hates evil. He is going to judge evil. He's going to judge sin. He's storing up wrath. <clears throat> And he's going to punish evildoers. 
And so it doesn't matter what some preachers say from the pulpit that you're okay if you, you know, you can do these things where sins are being now accepted and people are told they're okay. Well, they're being lied to. God hates those things. But on the other side of it, God only loves righteousness when we obey Him from a heart of faith and love. He doesn't want obedience in our actions and not from our hearts. I mean, if He did, then He would never condemn the Pharisees. He would never have condemned the ancient Israelites. Rather, they would have pleased God because they were outward. No, God condemned that heart. Isaiah 29, 13. Then the Lord said, Behold, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lips, service, but they remove their hearts from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. And Jesus quoted that passage in Matthew 15, 8, and 9. God wants a heart of faith, a heart of love, a desire that it's not about, Oh, if I don't do this, God is going to be angry and mad. No, I, I, I get to do this. I want to do this. I do this because I love God. I'm, doing, I'm living a life of faith in a, in a, here because I'm looking with the long view, an eternal view, as this psalm is encouraging us not to fret, but to trust God. And so because I trust God, I'm looking with the long view that though I cannot see it now, in the end, it's not going to be, it's, everything is not going to be for naught. It's going to be it's that here that it's going to, in the end, I will be with Christ forever. And so we want to do what God loves because we love God. You know, I, I couldn't even imagine, you know, a husband or a wife who genuinely loves one another is going to do what is going to do what the other person likes and loves. They're not going to do things that the opposite. The same way with a parent and child, that a child's going to, if they love their parents, they're going to do what that parent loves. And if a parent loves their child, they're not going to do things that are going to harm their child. Look at verse 29. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. Notice who's the one who gets in the end. The land. This is a promise to ancient Israel that they would inherit the land and continue living it if they obey the Lord. If they would, did not, they would be judged. <clears throat> and, you know, there was godly people that their line continued. There was Jeroboam and Ahab and others in ancient and northern tribes that their line ended after several generations. <clears throat> Same reason that Assyria and Babylon took Israel into captivity. And then later Rome expelled them from the land because they did not obey a God. But how does this apply to Christians? Well, Matthew 5.5 5 says, Blessed are the gentle, or King James, the meek, it's another word for humble, for they shall inherit the earth. So it could be, you know, gentle, humble, meek. There's the same Greek word. For they shall inherit the earth. That's God's people who have a greater inheritance, inheritance waiting. Eternal life, heaven. And then even in the new kingdom, in the, I should say in the new, in God's kingdom, when there's a new heaven and a new earth. Who's going to have the? Who's going to be living on the earth? It's God's people. It's God's people who inherit the earth. Not, not the not the wicked. The wicked will perish. The wicked will be cut off. And so we have a great inheritance waiting for us: eternal life. We have heaven. We'll be with God. We'll be with Christ forever. Look at verse 33. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue seeks justice. Notice that what it says about God's people. It gives a couple characteristics in this verse. Wisdom, the mouth, wisdom, and the tongue, justice. God's people speak what is right, speak the truth, speak what is encouraging rather than what destroys, what is edifying 
They speak thankfulness. I mean, the words that we speak reveals our character. And so what would our words reveal about us? Because we're not to engage in cursing and lies like the world. We're not to speak foolishness, but speak what is wise and helpful. We're not to speak like the world does and make jokes and light of stuff that make jokes about sin and make jokes about evil. We're not to engage in those things and do that. And so what is true of you? What is, how often is it true of you? About speaking what is right, about j- wisdom and justice. And there's a reason why God's people speak what is wise. That's found in verse 31. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The law of God is, new heart, is in his heart. For us, that's because of the new birth. That God has put his law in your heart. And that happened at the moment of the new birth. Where you were justified, sanctified, where God has forgiven you, made a child of heaven, an heir of heaven, but here a son of God. When all those things happen, the Holy Spirit comes in you, you have a new nature. A new nature. One that is different. One that is alive to God and not dead. One that loves God and obeys God. But here, it's not going to be perfect. That we can look back on our lives and think about some of the foolish things we did and said and how we can think about how did I do that but it's progressive. It's a progress. That we grow. That we grow in maturity. We grow in wisdom. And Psalm 1 adds to why this is true. Because His law is our hearts, but we're going to delight in the law of the Lord. In His law He meditates day and night. Psalm 1, 2-3. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. And whatever He does, He prospers. That's why this is true delighting, meditating upon God's Word. Spurgeon said this, Charles Spurgeon said this about this verse, the best thing in the best place producing the best results. Well might the man's talk be so admirable when his heart was so well stored. To love holiness, to have the motives and desires sanctified, to be in one's inmost nature obedient to the Lord. This is the surest method of making the whole run of our life efficient for its great ends. And even for securing the detail of it are steps from any serious mistake. Here our law. We delight in God's law. Meditating. Because think about it. Are you meditating upon God's word each and every day? Thinking about it. That meditating is thinking. I haven't used this illustration in quite a while. But worry is a form of meditation. But it's worry is focusing on the wrong things. Because... Why is worry a form of meditation? Because you're trying to solve a problem your own way. You're worrying about it, and you're trying to think about it, and you're trying to solve that problem rather than take it to the Lord. Meditating is taking Scripture. We think over Scripture. We think we can think on the way home today in our cars. We're on our way home thinking about what we heard this morning. How does this apply to my life? How can I live for God? Are you memorizing God's Word? Are you reading God's Word regularly rather than occasionally? God's Word is what makes you successful in the view of eternity. Joshua 1.8 tells what success really is. The bo- this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on day and night, so you may be careful to do all according that is written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have success. Success God's way and only God's way. Look at verses 32 and 33. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand or let him be condemned when he is judged. Wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. If it wasn't for the sovereignty of the Lord and God restraining evil, 
more Christians would be killed. I mean, there are those who watched David and sought to kill him. Saul was the classic example who sought to kill, kill David, who was godly. The wicked watched Jesus. So you could kill him, but you would often see in the Gospels, it wasn't yet his time. But if, it, if, they, if there was no, if God was not sovereign, then they would have done it ahead of time. Because their deeds were evil. They plotted against him. And they were only successful because God allowed it, because that was a time when, when Jesus would offer himself as a sacrifice. But you know what? If they hated Christ, they're going to hate you and I. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. But we have a promise that the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. So even though the world hates you, evildoers hate you, they may do things against you, God will never leave you nor forsake you. And so you don't need to fret and worry because God is with you. There may be times that you are allowed to be in the enemy's enemy's hand for a while like David who fled from Saul like Jeremiah who was arrested and put in prison Job who lost everything or just about everything except for his life and his wife's but you know what God will never leave you permanently there Job wasn't left permanently in Satan's underneath Satan's control David was not left permanently underneath Saul to flee for him forever Jeremiah was not in prison forever. And so God will never leave you there permanently. Spurgeon, I love what Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, said about this verse. Time shall reverse the verdict of haste, or else eternity shall clear away the condemnation of time. In due season, just men will be justified. Temporary injustices are tolerated in the order of providence, for purposes most wise. But the bitter shall not always be called sweet, nor not light forever be traduced as darkness. The right shall appear in due season. The fictitious and pretentious shall be unmasked, and the real and true shall be revealed. If we have done faithfully, we may appeal from the petty sessions of society to the solemn assize of the great day. Or see that we can appeal to the Lord because in due time in due season and so there is the future is bright for God's people because God and it also is bright because God exalts the humble verse 34 wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off you'll see it wait for the Lord keep his way this should remind you exalt you James 4, 6, and 7, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We wait for the Lord. We do what is good. We do what is right. We speak what is wise and helpful. And we trust the Lord. We wait for him. We wait for him by doing what we're supposed to be doing. We pray. We read God's word, meditate, trust. We do what is right. And he will exalt you in due time. But he says he'll cut the wicked off. And there's going to be a coming judgment day. There's a day of reckoning. A day that is coming. Matthew 25, 31 through 34 and 41. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. And there will be people who are saying, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
Do we not cast out demons? Do we not do these things? There's coming a day of day of reckoning. Because the goats, the goats are those who go to church, claim to be a Christian, but God's word have no effect on how they live their lives or even their speech. They talk religious, but what they say never takes effect in their life. Some of them we can see right through them. And some will not even know until the day of judgment. But these folks are Christian only na- in only name. And it's what's called nominal Christianity. And God questions that or gives a good definition of that. Nominal Christians are churchgoers or otherwise religious people whose faith does not go beyond being identified with a church, Christian group, or denomination. They are Christians in name, name only. Christ has no bearing in their lives. Nominal Christians may attend church and Christian functions. They self-identify as Christians, but it's just a label. They view religion primarily as a social construct, and they do not allow it to require much of them in terms of morality or responsibility. Nominalists take a minimalist approach to their faith. And Jesus uh, addressed this in his early ministry, as well as this addressed to the church at Sardis. Revelation 3.1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars say this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you are dead. And that describes many, sadly. And we always should be examining our lives to see from their faith, because I don't know your heart, and you don't you can't know what's my, I just say, you don't know what my thoughts are, and I can't tell what your thoughts are, but the Bible says we should always examine ourselves to make sure we're in the faith. Are we doing what is right and good because we have a new heart? Our lives have been changed. Are we walking in God's ways? Are we alive or are we a dead? Are we almost a Christian is what we could say this. We could say this is, Almost a Christian is what a nominal is. Almost because of just going to church, but I do whatever else I want the rest of the day and the rest of the week. And that's going to end in disaster. That's the life that's built on sand in Jesus' parable. That's going to end in disaster. A foundation built upon Christ is that rock in his parable that when the storms of life come, when the storms of judgment come, it stands. It's been proven to be true. But the sand is going to reveal that it wasn't. It was just a house that didn't have a foundation at all. And so we must examine our lives as we're going to see, see from the faith. Because it is too late when we stand before Christ. And he says, depart from me. And there's no, there's no, no chance. The only chance that we have in this life is now why there's breath in our lungs, that we can call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And there may be those who are listening later, or even now, that you don't know whether you're saved. I encourage you to examine your life. Call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon Him to save you. If you examine your life and you see that you're not saved, call upon Him. Repent of your sin. And trust Christ and trust only in Christ. It's only the righteousness of Christ that saves you. Because you need the righteousness of Christ imputed to you, accredited to your account. It's not Jesus plus any good works or anything. It's Jesus only. It is His righteousness that God will accept. And that you can go to God. Forgive me a sinner, Lord. I know what I deserve. I deserve punishment. I deserve hell. I deserve to be separated and depart. But Lord, forgive me. I trust in Christ that He died on the cross for my sin. And it's His righteousness that makes me righteous. And so call upon Him for where you're at. And so I must say this. The future is bright for God's people in eternity. But it's not so for the wicked. The future is not bright. It's grim. And, it's, and there are those who think, well, I will find out. Well, don't wait to find out. Because if you do wait to find out, it is too late. 
Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to turn to Christ. And for Christians, be encouraged because the future is bright. Things look at grims at times. Things can get frustrating. Things can be unfair. And when they do, when you start to be tempted that way, look to Christ, look to God, look to eternal view, and be encouraged because the future is bright. That this is not the best. The best is in the future. The best is with God in eternity. We can suffer for a little time. For a little time. 120 years is nothing compared to eternity. And so the best is yet to come and the future is bright.